uh, first of all, good evening to one and all present here. Hope you are all safe and healthy. On behalf of ISA Bangalore students, I welcome all participants to the fifth day of the Mathematics Online Camp. Today's student lecture will be by Suita Hazara. She has recently passed her MMAT and her main field of interest is algebra. I welcome her to share her views on the topic algebraic geometry. Uh, Suita D will speak for about an hour and then we are going to reserve about 20 minutes for questions. Please do, please do type in your questions in the main chat box. We will fill all the questions and ask Suita D at the end of lecture. All the participants are also requested to keep yourself on mute and your video off unless asked by the speaker. Now, without any further delay, let's begin today's lecture. Over to you, Suita D. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. Okay, I will share my screen now. It is feasible, right? Yes, it's feasible. Yes. Okay, now. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction for the algebraic geometry. Uh, you have recently have done the course of proposition rational itself. He has uh, given a very nice introduction motivation for uh, this course. And actually, I am uh, reviewing this uh, in a, another viewpoint, uh, mostly in affine spaces and then I introduce a little bit of projective space and then um, try to give some applications uh, to inspire you. Okay, let's start. So uh, first I have written some notations which I will uh, use throughout the lecture. So KB any field, mostly we will, uh, after some time, we, I will say that when uh, mostly we use the algebraic closed field but uh, for this scenario, it's okay for any field. So I will uh, say when it is required to have the algebraic closedness property. So K is uh, any field and by A and K, I have uh, denoted the Cartesian product of K uh, with it in n times. That is the, it is uh, any element of A and K is just the uh, n tuples where the each tuple is from. Uh, the field K. That is the point is like A1, A2, AN, where AI is from K. Uh, so very clearly A1 is, A1 K is affine line, A2 K is affine plane. Uh, and uh, later on we mm, just remove the field K and just write AN. So mm, now I mm, denote that for F belongs to K, X1, X2, Xn. A point P belongs to A1, A2, AN belongs to A and K is called a zero of F is F of P is zero. It's very clear to you. So uh, if F is not constant, the set of zeros is called hypersurface defined by F and I will denote it by, mostly it is denoted by VF. So now a hypersurface in A2K is uh, affine plane curve. And if F is a polynomial of degree one, VF is called a hyperplane in A and K. So thus we have seen that uh, if F is a polynomial, just V of F. Now we, we are interested in, if we have a set of polynomials, what, what can be the set of common zeros of that polynomials? So I have uh, a collection of polynomials Mm, from k x1 x2 xn so i denote i define mm, uh, the set of common zeros as f of mm, thus p so that f of p is zero for all f belongs to s and i will denote it by v of s so it is nothing but the intersection of v of f f belongs to s because each p belongs to uh, each p should vanish for each f now here is a definition that subset X subset of A and K is an affine algebraic set or simply an algebraic set if X equals to V of S for some S. 
So such sets we call the algebraic set, affine algebraic set. Uh, now we simply call it algebraic set. So we are interested to have some properties of these sets. So it will be clear that why uh, we are studying for such sets, algebraic sets. So uh, a very interesting property that if i is an ideal in kx1 xtxn generated by s, then vs is nothing but v of i. So now if we have the generator set for an ideal, the common zeros of that ideal is same as the set of polynomials. So any algebraic set is represented as v of i for some ideal i. So for any algebraic set, we have to get an ideal. It's a very interesting property. So next property is very clear that uh, V of union of I alpha is uh, intersection of V of I alpha, where I alpha is collection of ideals. That is intersection of arbitrary collection of algebraic sets is algebraic set. That is the set collection of algebraic sets is closed under arbitrary intersection. Okay, this is a very important property. Okay, I will come it later. Now for the third point, if my I subset of J, V of I is superset of VJ, you can easily check these properties uh, because these are mostly set theoretic and you can check it. Now the fourth pro property says that V of FG is V of F union V of G. It is also very clear. Now where FG belongs to KX1, XTXN, VI, um, so, if ij are two ideals, vi union vj is v of fj, f belongs to i, g belongs to j. That is, any finite union of algebraic sets is an algebraic set. So, the set of algebraic collection of algebraic sets is closed under finite union. So, if you have introduced uh, with a little bit of point set topology, you can notice that uh, the uh, collection of algebraic sets is closed under arbitrary intersections and closed under finite unions. So mostly we have these properties, mostly, you know, now in topology, we are accustomed to have this property for the closed sets. The closed sets have this property that they are closed under arbitrary intersection and finite unions. So there is there may be some uh, relation between these algebraic sets and the closed sets. So from this, there comes Jarisky topology. I am not going here uh, in this lecture, but it's just for your information. If you have some um, points of topological basis, you can understand it, or you can guess it at least. Also, it's a very uh, natural property that uh, V of zero is A and K because all uh, points are vanishes at zero. It is a zero polynomial. And V of one is phi because no polynomial, uh, no point can vanishes. And not only one, any constant for any constant V of uh, alpha is phi. Also, V of X1 minus A1, Xn minus A n is a singleton point because uh, each uh, coordinates are precise for a single point. No? Uh, so it's a singleton point A1, A2, An. So uh, from the fourth property, we have that any finite subset of A and K is also an algebraic set because each single term is algebraic set and we uh, have the finite union of that single term set and it's an algebraic set. So, um, okay, I um, can make a announcement that if you have any question or need any clarification in between the lectures, please interrupt me. I will try to clarify you because it is uh, it can be easy in between the lectures also. So now, uh, for x subset of a and k, now consider i of x such that f belongs to k x and x to x n, such that f a one a to a n is zero for all a one a to a n belongs to x. It is called the ideal of x. So we have seen before that um, we have a set of polynomials or 
the gener uh, the an ideal generated by this uh, set of polynomials and we can correspond it to a algebraic set now we have a set in ank and we consider the ideal of x so it also has some very nice properties so i am going to here now if x subset of a then uh, i x superset of i of y you can easily check it also um, uh, a subset of i of b of s for any set of polynomials uh, this may seem uh, some rigorous to you if you first time see it but if you sit alone and uh, think a little bit over it you can easily solve it because uh, they are the mostly the set theoretic intuition is uh, enough for doing this uh, the proofs of all these properties so um, may not be uh, for all of you who have not seen it before may not be it seem easy but uh, if you think a little bit it is easy so uh, a subset of i of v of s and a subset of v of i of x so from this also from uh, first and second you can easily verify it at a moment that v of i of v of s is v of s where s is a set of polynomials and i of v of i of s is i of s where x is set of points so if uh, v not is an algebraic set and v not is v of i of v not and if i not is an ideal of an algebraic set i not is i of v of i not now there is also it's very trivial that i of i is uh, k x on x k x n and i of a n k is zero if k is an infinite field and i x is uh, it is a very important property that i x is a radical ideal for x subset of a n k so uh, what is radical ideal radical ideal is uh, for an ideal i radical of i is uh, defined as the collection of r belongs to r such that r to the power n belongs to i for some n belongs to n now i is a uh, radical ideal if i equals to radical i so it's a very important property that i x is a radical ideal so i am not uh, going to the proofs because uh, the proofs are very set theoretic you can do it easily and if you want to make me some clarification for the proofs now you can say it now it's also welcome should i proceed i actually i cannot see the chat box okay okay then i think uh, i can proceed So uh, now it is a very important theorem that every algebraic set is the intersection of a finite number of hypersurfaces. So the proof is nothing but the requirement of the Hilbert basis theorem that if R is Noetherian real, then R of x on x to x n is also Noetherian real. Using this Hilbert basis theorem, we can prove it easily that every algebraic set is the intersection of a finite number of hypersurfaces so these are very important theorem as uh, because we can easily see it as finite number of hypersurfaces so it's one kind of characterization of algebraic sets 
Now, an algebraic set V is irreducible if IV is prime. So if IV is, okay, I have absolute. Uh, I think I have missed one definition because uh, you are not introduced with what is irreducible algebraic set. Okay, A, an algebraic set V is said to be reducible if V can be written as union of algebraic sets, that is V1 union V2. And if it is not, if we cannot write it as union of algebraic sets, then the algebraic set is said to be irreducible. So it is very clear you no know, in representation theory or any building, uh, any uh, space of mathematics, we see that there are some building blocks and using those, uh, we can easily make the, easily make any other objects. And those building blocks are not divisible at all. So, the irreducible uh, algebraic set, set, the concept is uh, almost alike. We see the prime factorization theorem where the primes uh, acts as the irreducible ones. Uh, in the representation theory, there are irreducible representations and from that representations, we can make the other representations also. And here is also uh, that from the irreducible ones, we can make any algebraic set. So it is a very important property that an algebraic set V is irreducible if and only if IV is prime. So the proof is also very simple. I have sketched the proof. Uh, if IV is not prime, let F1, F2 belongs to IV. This is the product F1 into F2, no, but F5 does not belongs to IV. F1, F2 are polynomials in KX1, X2, X7. So uh, since F1, F2 belongs to IV, so V equals to V of F1, F2. Since uh, V of F1, F2 is V F1 union V F2. So V is V intersection V F1 union V intersection V F2. And also V intersection V F5 is proper subset of V because F5 does not belongs to I V for I equals to one, two. So uh, since they are two proper subsets and V can be written as the union of two proper algebraic sets by the definition of irreducibility, V is reducible. So if IV is not prime, we have V is reducible. Conversely, if V is uh, reducible, that is V can be written as union of two proper algebraic sets, uh, VI I equals to one, two, VI subset of V, then IV I is a proper superset of IV, that is uh, we can find some FI belongs to IVI, so that FI does not belongs to IV, I equals to one, two, uh, but uh, F1, F2 belongs to IV because V equals to V1 union V2. So IV is not a prime. Since IV not prime ideal, sorry, since V is irreducible, we have IV is not prime ideal. So we have the both parts that if V is irreducible, IV is prime. Let V be an algebraic set in A and K, then there are unique irreducible algebraic sets V1, V2, Vm, such that V equals to V1 union Vm and Vi not subset of Vg. That is, any one is content in another. No one is content in another. So this Vi are called the irreducible components of V, and we can write V equals to union of Vi, I equals to 1 to N, and this presentation is called the decomposition of V into irreducible components. So it is almost like uh, the prime factorization. No? Uh, in every space, we have some semblance in any field of mathematics. It's a very natural and very interesting to study and uh, seek the oneness of the truth.
So now it's also a very interesting uh, proposition that if f and g are polynomials with, uh, without any common factor, then vfg is uh, vf intersection vg uh, is a finite set of points. That is, f and g intersect in finitely many points if they have no common factors. Uh, I have sketched the proof that uh, since fg have no common factor in kx, y. It is the ring uh, generated by the variables x, y, and the elements of k. They have no common factors in k, x, y. This is uh, k, x is the quotient field of k, the ring k, x. Uh, so now, since k, x is field, k, x, y is PID. So uh, f, g equals to 1 implies uh, there exists R s belongs to k, x, y, such that R f plus h, g equals to 1. So we have uh, non-zero d belongs to kx such that dr equals to a and ds equals to b, now where ab belongs to kxy. So we have a plus bg equals to d. Now if ab belongs to v, vfg, then da equals to zero. Uh, if we put the value in the above equation, it gives da equals to zero. So as d belongs to kx and uh, it is a polynomial in one variable, so it has uh, finitely many zeros. So only a finite number of x coordinates can appear among the points of VFG. So the points of VFG can uh, occur, can have only finitely many x coordinates. The so similar um, reason is uh, reasoning is going for the y coordinates also. So we have the finite number of uh, x coordinates, finite number of y coordinates occurring among the points of the VFG. So the points of VFG must be finite. So the theorem is complete. Now it has to correlate that uh, if K is infinite, the irreducible algebraic subsets of A to K are A to K by the points, there's a singleton points or the collection of finite number of points and the irreducible plane curves VF, where F is an irreducible polynomial and VF is infinite. Now I have just said the uh, decomposition of any uh, algebraic set into its uh, irreducible components. So how can we ca compute that uh, irreducible components? Here is the trick that if k is algebraic closed, if non-constant polynomial in kxy, then uh, f equals to f1 to the power n1, f2 to the power n r be the decomposition of f into irreducible factors. We know it that uh, any polynomial we can decompose it as uh, product of irreducible factors so clearly v of f is uh, v of f1 union uh, dot, 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 v of fr this gives the decomposition of vf into irreducible components and i of v of this um, i of v of f is nothing but the ideal generated by f1 f2 f1 so you see that i have uh, written here that k algebraic closed so from now we definitely assume that k is algebraic closed because uh, you have seen that uh, professor shuresh sir has uh, given the remedies and the first remedy probably the first remedy was that no we have not find the equality and the one of the reasons is we have not assumed the field as the algebraic closed so for that remedy to have that nice equality we have assumed that uh, all the fields here are algebraically closed so under this assumption hilbert nelson research says that for i it is weak hilbert nelson research uh, it says that for i a proper ideal in kx and x to xn vi is non-empty Obviously, it is for algebraic closed field because otherwise, if you take that uh, k is r and i is the proper uh, k is the real field and i is uh, the ideal generated by say x square plus one, so you cannot find any real number which satisfies the equation or which belongs to the uh, algebraic set v of i. So for this, v of i is empty, but we have. Uh, assumed here that k is algebraic closed. 
to have that v of i is non-empty for any proper ideal i of k x on x t x n. And if i is an ideal k x on x t x n, k algebraically closed, i of v of i is radical i. So uh, if you can remember that we have uh, have we have the properties that uh, i of v is an radical ideal. So it is nothing but i of v of i is just a radical i. It's a very important property. Now, um, this gives a corollary that uh, if i subset of kx and x to xn be an ideal, vi is finite if and only if kx and x to xn quotiented by i is a finite dimensional vector space over k. And also the number of points of vi is less than equal to dimension of kx on x to xn quotiented by i over the field k. So now we are in a situation that we can easily have a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the algebraic objects and geometric objects. We have the radical ideals i and the algebraic sets. Sorry, here is a typo that. It should not be i of vi, it should be v of i because it is algebraic set. Uh, prime ideals is corresponding to irreducible algebraic sets. Maximal ideals is corresponding to points because we have seen that x1 minus a1, x1 minus n is going to the point a1, a2, n. And irreducible polynomials is going to irreducible hypersurfaces in a and k that f is going to v of f. This is the, this gives us the where the irreducible polynomials give us the factorization of any polynomials, where the irreducible hypersurfaces is giving us the irreducible decomposition of any algebraic set. So here now comes variety. We say variety, now it is affine variety. We now say the irreducible algebraic sets as variety. It's just a nomenclature for convenience because the irreducible algebraic set is very big name to say once again. So we call it variety. So now if V subset of N non-empty variety, I of V is subset of Kx and Xtxn is a prime idea because we have seen that uh, V is Irreducible if and only if IV is prime. So uh, the integral domain, the gamma V, I have denoted by gamma V. So gamma V is Kx on X to Xn quotiented by IV. Since IV is prime ideal, gamma V is integral domain. And we name is as the coordinate ring of V. So you can see it now that a function f belongs to f of vk. f of vk is uh, the set of functions from v to k. It's called the polynomial function. If there exists a polynomial, uh, f belongs to kx on x to xn such that the small f and capital F coincides on the points of v. So if f and g are two polynomials, and they, f minus g vanishes on all points of v, they are the same function in gamma v. So it is clear that we have two important ways to view an element of gamma v. We can see it a function on v, that is, uh, it's a, it is in the quotient ring, kx on x to xn modulo iv, that is, it's a function from v to k. And we can also see it as an equivalence class of polynomials. What is the equivalence relation is given here? No, f is equivalent to g, for if g belongs to kx on x to xn, 
if and only if f minus g vanishes for all points of p. So here is two views of gamma phi. And mostly we use uh, it at a function of phi, but the equivalence class of polynomials is a very beautiful view to see the functions of, of gamma phi. Now, if V subset of A and W subset of A and V to varieties, a mapping a phi V to W is called a polynomial map. If there exist polynomials T1, T2, Tm belongs to Kx1, X2, Xm, such that phi A1, A2, Am is T1, A1 to M, Tm, A1 to M for all A1, A2, Am belongs to V. That is uh, all the points, the image of the points, we can write it as some polynomials in A1, A2, Am and this double. So we call such mapping a polynomial map from V to W. So we can easily check that um, for the projection map P A N to A R for N greater or equal to R defined by P A1 A2 A N is equals to A1 A2 A R. It's a polynomial map because T I A1 A2 A R N is A I. So it's obviously a polynomial map. Um, T I is polynomial and so P is a polynomial map. Now, any mapping phi V to W gives a homomorphism phi T to W. From the function of W to K to the space functions of from V to K, which is defined as phi tilde f is f compose phi. Because if phi is from v to w, and we have f belongs to f w k, so phi sends is v to w, and f sends is from w to k, so f compose phi sends is from v to k. So f compose phi is belongs to f of v k. So it's mm, each map phi v to w gives a homomorphism phi tilde. Now, if phi is polynomial map, then phi tilde gamma w, gamma w is the coordinate ring of w, okay, I can show it once for you. Gamma phi this gamma v. That is the functions on phi. So this coordinate for this coordinate ring v, if phi is a polynomial map, then phi tilde gamma w is subset of gamma v. That is the coordinate ring of w image under phi, phi tilde goes into gamma v, coordinate ring of v. Because you can see that if f belongs to gamma w, that is f equals to some capital F plus i w, that is uh, some i w residue of polynomials in kx on x to x n. Now phi tilde f is f compose phi. Now phi is polynomial map. So there exist polynomials uh, t1, t2, tm such that phi a1, a2, am is given by t1, t2, tm. So using this, you can see that phi tilde f of phi tilde of f that is f compose phi is often as the i phi residue of f of t1 t2 tm so t1 t2 tm are polynomials f is itself a polynomial so f of t1 t2 tm is a polynomial and since t ti's are polynomials in x1 x2 kx1 x2 xn so f of t1 t2 tm is a polynomial in kx1 x2 xn so if phi is a polynomial map, this is the requirement here, then we have phi tilde gamma w is subset of gamma phi. That is then the homomorphism phi tilde sends the coordinate ring of w to the coordinate ring of phi. So if phi is not a polynomial, we can't say it because 
then the T1, T2, Tm may not be polynomials, there may be others. So phi's polynomial map is important here. So now there is a one-on -one correspondence between phi v to w a polynomial map, then phi tilde gamma w to gamma v homomorphisms. So this is the restriction of phi tilde restricted to gamma w. This phi tilde actually it is a restriction map, restriction map of the above uh, phi tilde. And um, this restriction, we call it again phi tilde. So it's give a homomorphism from gamma w to gamma phi, that's coordinate rings of w to coordinate rings of phi. So now a polynomial map phi b to w is an isomorphism. If there is a polynomial map psi w to phi, such that psi composed phi is identity on phi and phi composed psi is identity on w. It's very natural. Now, so now the above one on correspondence, this one on correspondence, ensures that two affine varieties are isomorphic if and only if their coordinate strings are isomorphic. Because if phi and uh, v and w are isomorphic, we have um, phi and w satisfying the above conditions. So for this, we have the phi tilde, psi tilde, such that psi compose phi whole tilde is identity and uh, phi compose psi whole tilde is identity, that's their coordinate rings are isomorphic. So this is a very important result that two affine varieties are isomorphic if and only if their coordinate strings are isomorphic. So if one thing we know, we can uh, easily get the other. Now our coordinate geometry here is also the change of coordinate things because you see that uh, when we have any arbitrary point, naturally our tendency is to shift it to origin so that our computations uh, get easy and we are uh, very uh, advantageously do it. So this is the concept of co coordinate geometry and same concept is uh, here also applicable, the change of coordinates. So what should I do for this? Now if uh, t equals to t1, t2, tm, a1 to am be a polynomial map, if belongs to x1, x2, x, k, x1, x2, xm. Now we denote f of t. Okay. We denote f t by t tilde f. So t tilde f means f of t1, t2, tm. Now if v is an algebraic set of m and i an ideal, vt is the algebraic set. It's defined as t inverse v, that's v of i t. Which is it? It is the ideal generated by f of t. So we have f, we have t, we can compute f of t. Now we have an ideal i. For ideal i, we compute f t, f belongs to i, that is from this i, we compute i t. Now we define v t as v of i t. So this is the change of polynomials. Now I am going to how to change the coordinates using this definition. So an affine change of coordinates of an is a polynomial map t from an to an because its change of coordinates is itself to itself where each ti is a polynomial of degree one and t is bijection. So it is clear that for the uh, coordinate change in our coordinate geometry, we just rotate and or translate or both. So here is the same recipe. We have uh, ti equals to summation aijxj, ai plus ai zero. So uh, remember that there, the rotation is a linear transformation and the translation is an affine map. So here is also the same thing. We have such ti, summation aij xj plus ai0. We can see that uh, t equals to t1 tr compose tl, where tl is the linear map and 
linear map, it's uh, the TIL is given by summation AIJXJ, summation over J, and TR is the translation. Where uh, TIR is XI plus AI naught. So using this composition, we can get this coordinate change. So using this coordinate change, we can easily you know, make any points to shift it to origin to have the simpler calculations. So clearly, if T and S are affine changes of coordinates of N, T composites and uh, T inverse are also because uh, they are also satisfying those property that is in bijection, it's also linear. So they are also uh, coordinate chains. Moreover, if T and to N uh, is an isomorphism of variety because we have defined which is the isomorphism variety. That's uh, if two affine pairs are isomorphic, if and only if their coordinates chains are isomorphic, we have that property and we have defined also the isomorphism. So from this definition of isomorphism, we can say that this affine change, affine coordinate change is an isomorphism from A to N. That's one kind of automorphism type. Now, for uh, in order to variety V in N, its coordinate ring gamma V is a domain. So now you are interested to deduce it quotient field. So this field, the quotient field of this coordinate ring, is called the field of rational functions on V, and it is written as K of V. Elements of K of V are known as the rational functions on V. So if F belongs to KV and P belongs to V. We say that F is defined at P if for some AB belongs to gamma V, F can be written as A by B, where BP non zero. So uh, it's also very natural intuition for us to, when we have some domain, we want to compute the quotient fields of it. And obviously, it has some necessity for the further properties to develop, to have the local rings further, and from that define the intersection numbers and all kinds of things. But I am I have not the time to go through such details in this lecture. So I can't uh, give you any ready application for this theory, but you can see that I like the coordinate geometry or whichever I, we have uh, read before, here is also we can have the mappings on the varieties, the isomorphisms, the morphisms on the varieties, the isomorphisms on the varieties, and also we have the rational functions on the varieties. So uh, there may be many defined ways to choose a b such that a equals to a by b, b b non zero. Uh, but if gamma v is uft, there is essentially a unique representation. It's very clear. Uh, that a equals to a by b, where a b has no common factor, a b have no common factor, then f is defined at p if and only if b p is non-zero. We call that f is defined at p if a equals to a by b, where a b has no common zero, and b p equals to zero. This is uh, for f belongs to k v and p belongs to v, we said f is defined at p. Okay. So now it may seem a great jump from these affine sets, but just for sake, uh, actually I am not going to the projective space in details, but I want to give you some ready application of this algebraic geometry, a very interesting uh, application. So for this, I need a little bit of a projective space concept. And uh, I have heard the lecture of Professor Shuris Nelsers, and uh, he has very explicitly given the motivation and very interestingly that uh, why should come the projective space? 
it comes as a remedy to find the missing points uh, which we can't find in the affine space that is to make uh, our inequality a nicer equality for the basic zero so just for the sake of completeness i am uh, saying here the definition of projective space and i think you have heard also now uh, the why the projective space come came and uh, the very intuitive idea to define the elements of projective space it's very natural idea uh, he gave it is very nice so here i have just written the rigorous definition uh, and just using this i will go through some very applications okay so just i define the projective space that uh, if k be a field you know uh, it already uh, so projective end space over k is denoted by p and k and mostly we define p n uh, it's uh, defined as uh, the n plus a n plus 1 excluding the point origin 0 0 0 under the equivalence relation and so which is the equivalence relation that for x equals to x1 x to xn plus 1 y equals to y1 or to y1 plus 1 belongs to n plus 1 minus this origin x is equivalent to y if and only if there exists non-zero lambda belongs to k such that xi equals to lambda yi for i equals to 1 to n plus 1. Now for any set S of polynomials in kx1 x to xn, let Vs equals to P. So you have noticed that uh, you have noticed that uh, he has written the elements of P as this structure. Mm, so the elements of P in Pn says that if P is zero for all F belongs to S. It is a very analogous definition for the affine varieties and there is a very similar properties with the affine varieties all the properties i have said uh, just we need the homogeneous ones here to fulfill this property this to compatible for this equivalence relation we just need the homogeneous ones so otherwise it is almost similar so i'm not going into details now for any set s of polynomials in uh, kx1 x2 xn xn plus one let v of s equals to now sorry it is a repetition okay we have defined v of s as a points such that f of p is zero for all f belongs to s now if uh, i is the ideal generated by s then v of i is v of s same thing as the find one so such a set is called an algebraic set in pn or a projective algebraic set so there it was a fine algebraic set which we have uh, called till before now we are introduced with the projective algebraic set otherwise it is almost similar so we have seen already also that uh, the most important thing here to have this equality in Bayes' theorem, and to for this remedy, we have introduced this projective space. So Bayes' theorem states that let f g be a uh, projective plane curves on degree m and n respectively, and if f g have no common component, then summation i a, p f intersection g is m. -N. So you will uh, say, ask me that why, what is I P F intersection C? It is the intersection number. You have the intuition, I, intuitive idea of the intersection number uh, from the last lecture, previous lecture. So here also I am not going to the details uh, and the rigorous definition of the intersection number because uh, it requires the, um, some conception of local rings. So you have the intuitive idea um, and you know that uh, this equality is not, does not, may not hold in affine projective spaces, sorry, affine um, algebraic sets. So for this, we need the projective ones and here the equality occurs. So now I am 
going through a little bit of discussion for the intersection number. So if F and G be plane curves and P belongs to A2, we are interested in to have the concept of intersection number. We will denote it by IPA, F intersection C, the intersection number of F and G at P. We say F and G intersect properly at P if F and G have no common component that passes through P. So if F and G have no common component that passes through P, we can we say that F and G intersect properly at P. Now two curves F and G are said to intersect transversally at P if P is a simple point at both on F and G. And if the tangent line to F at P is different from the tangent line to G at P. So here I have drawn a example that you can see that tangent line of G and F are distinct. So F and G are intersecting transversally and P is also a simple point. So what is simple point? I have defined here for their convenience that for a curve F and P belongs to F, a point P is called a simple point. If uh, FXP and FYP does not vanish together. And in this case, uh, this line is called the tangent line to F where P is AP. So if P is not simple, it's known as multiple point or singular point. A curve with only sing simple points is called a non-singular curve. So you can see that uh, in y equals to x square, there is no point of sim uh, singularity because uh, del y del x is one, it does not vanish. So it's non-singular. Now for the point, I'm sorry, for the curve, y square equals to x cube at the point um, origin you see that uh, del f del x is 3x square and uh, del f del y is 2y both are vanishing so it's a singularity and also for the um, curve y square equals to x square plus x cube there's singularity because both the partial derivatives of x and partial derivatives for x and y are vanishing but see that here is uh, a little bit of difference for this singularity and for this singularity. I'm not going into details, but see, we can we say this node and this is S cast. Both of uh, them are double point. That is multiple point means um, I can here just at one um, say that we can also reduce the multiplicity of the multiple point. So there is some calculation. It's not hard, but um, I have no time to introduce you um, to it. So just I have uh, shown you very intuitively and uh, very little notations and uh, definitions. Now using this concept of intersection number, I will define the intersection cycle. If F and G are two projective plane curves of degree M and N respectively with no common components, then the intersection cycle F dot G, it is written as F dot G and it's defined as summation P belongs to P2, I, P, F intersection G. This is the intersection number. And this is this is an integer and it's the just uh, sum of the points. So is this P sorry. It's P plus Q or something. Or 2P plus Q such types. So this is I, this I called the intersection cycle. Now, uh, sorry. 
a zero cycle on p2 is a formal sum summation n p p where n p are the integers and all but a finite number of n p s are zero so it's a important thing that all but uh, finite number of n p s are zero so it is actually a finite sum and the degree of a zero cycle is given by summation n p p belongs to i p so here it's also the intersection cycle is also a zero cycle with the integers the intersection numbers so clearly here the degree of the intersection cycle is summation of ip f intersection g so basis theorem says us that f dot g is a positive zero cycle of degree mn because summation i p f intersection g is mn we have seen basis theorem this property this is a basis theorem saying us and here we have defined the degree of a zero cycle as by summation n p p belongs to p2 so now i am going to introduce the addition on a cubic so we can uh, form a group structure using the points of the cubic so let's suppose i uh, see a non singular curve now for p q belongs to c there exists a unique line l such that l dot c l dot c means the intersection cycle which i have just defined it is p plus q plus r so you see that uh, since degree of c is 3 uh, c is a cubic so and l is linear so l dot c can contain at most 3 because bayes theorem says that uh, not at most 3 it is exactly 3 because we are now in projective space so bayes theorem says that the degree of this cycle l dot c is 3 and since we have p q belongs to c and p q are going through the point um, going through uh, sorry p q are on the uh, cubic c so l dot c must contain p and q and another point we call it r so if p equals to q l is nothing but the tangent line at l at p otherwise p if you q are distinct they are the simple lines so now we define phi c cross c c is the non singular curve to c by phi pq equals to r so we have pq on c we have the line l so such that l dot c is p plus q plus r that is l intersects c at p q and r is a simple thing that l intersects c in three points p q and r three points including the multiplicity because if it is tangent point then uh, the multiplicity will be more than one but if uh, p and q are two points in uh, c then phi of p q we defined it as r it is the rest point which the line l intersects in c now you can say that uh, we can define the addition on c by this phi but uh, here is no identity what can be we fixed at an identity so first we have to fix a point so for this we fix a point o on c now we define the addition on c as p dx uh, not uh, its dx sum is uh, the addition now p addition q defined by phi of origin and phi pq okay i will go to the next slide to make you more simple so here you see that p and q two points on c and uh, this is the line l this is the line l you can see the line l and it intersects uh, the curve c at r so phi pq is r by definition now p plus q is the point so we have phi pq we have o we join the line phi pq 
R and O and it intersects the conic at a point this point. So this point we take as P plus Q. So we have P, we have Q, we have R, phi P, Q, and then we join the line to O. We, it, now, now we have fixed O for this curve. It is fixed, O is fixed. So O and R we join and it will intersect the point and phi P, Q. I'm sorry, zero, uh, phi of zero phi P, Q. And it is defined as P plus Q. So the proposition, uh, you can easily also check it. The associativity is a little bit cumbersome, but other, other ways it's okay. Now see, uh, with this uh, operation is an abelian group where the point zero is the identity. Now, why zero is identity here? You can see it uh, very easily that uh, if, uh, let suppose P be a point and you uh, have that, you join the line P and R, so uh, sorry, P and O, and it intersects the uh, con cubic at R. It is phi P zero. So now phi P zero, uh, sorry, phi P O, and phi P O and O, we join this line, and this line is nothing but the previous line, no? So this line again intersects the P. Okay. P and O joined, we get phi P0. Now phi P0 and O join and extend. It intersects is P. So phi, so now phi 0 R is P. So P plus 0, sorry, I am, mm, it's not 0, it's O. P plus O is O. Sorry, P plus O is P. So O is the identity. It is the definition of identity in our group. So P plus O is P, so O is the identity here. Now, what is the inverse of P? Suppose Q is the inverse of P, we just uh, suppose it that it's a point. Now, by definition, phi, P, uh, phi 0, phi PQ, phi O, phi PQ, it is O. So there exists L such that L dot C is O plus O plus phi PQ. So L is the tangent line at O. Now uh, we can have the point where the tangent line intersects the conic. Sorry, intersects the cubic. So it is the point phi PQ. Now phi PQ is the point, and we have there exists a line. So uh, I denote phi PQ as R now. Phi PQ is R. So clearly there exists a uh, line M says that M dot C is P plus Q plus R. So clearly Q equals to phi PR our, by our definition. And we have, suppose that Q is the inverse of P. So we have the inverse of P as phi PR. Here R equals to phi PQ. So thus we get the inverse also. Now we can apply it. Okay, um, can I take uh, five more minutes? I think I can wrap up um, it within five Just minutes. It's fine. Okay, okay. thanks. So uh, here is a proposition. Actually, it is an application of Max Neuther's lemma. I have not started here because it also requires some prerequisites. Um, so using this uh, proposition, you can see the ready applications of the very important the Pascal's theorem and Pappas theorem. That's why I have um, stated the proposition here, and it is it can be done by the Max Neuther's lemma. So if C C does uh, be two cubics and uh, C C does dot C is a sum of it's a formal sum P i i equals to one to n. Let Q be a conic and Q dot C is a uh, formal sum, those PI and so the first six. You can uh, nomen 
clutter it by pion p2 pion so that it's a first six so it's not problem now if we assume that uh, pion p2 p6 are simple points on c then p7 p8 p9 lie on a straight line so this proposition gives us this conclusion so now using this proposition which is a very application of max neuther's lemma so from this we have the pascal's theorem but it says that if a hexagon is inscribed in an irreducible conic then the opposite sides meet in collinear points so i have given here the hints and i think you can understand it if c is a three sides so it's a cubic and see this the corresponding opposite sides so c dash is also a cubic and the conic which is the irreducible conic in the problem i have uh, taken it as cube now you use the previous proposition what it says no c dash c is summation pi you can do that's the nine points and since the hexagon is ins uh, inscribed in the irreducible conic so q dot c is nothing but the six points of those pi any six points you can uh, name it by one to uh, six the first six so what remains the remaining points are the p7 p8 p9 and these are collinear this means P7, P8, P9 lie in a straight line. So the opposite sides, sorry, C and C dash, their intersecting points meet in a collinear points. So we can have a very short and uh, very brief proof for the Pascal lemma using this proposition. It's a very nice proof. Very brief. Sorry. Now I'm going to the Pepper's theorem. It's also very nice that uh, if L1, L2 are two lines and P1, P2, P3 belongs to L1 and Q1, Q2, Q3 belongs to L2. So here is two lines, L1 and L2, P1, P2, P3, Q1, Q2, Q3. And now uh, obviously, you have assumed that none of these points is in L1 intersection L2. That is not this point. Now, uh, let Lij be the line between Pi and Qj. So, I have uh, drawn all the lines Pi and Qj where I not equal to J. So, for each Ijk with Ijk in between 1 to 3, let Rk equals to Lji dot Ljk. So now R1, R2, R3 are collinear. You can see that this is collinear. So it is also a ready application for, of the above proposition. So I just finished by this proposition that let's see C dash, C double dash be cubics and C is irreducible cubic and C dash dot C is summation of PI I equals to one to one where PI are simple. They may not be distinct points of C and let C dash dot C is summation PI plus Q, then Q equals to PN. So if we have such properties, we can recognize Q as the PN. Q equals to PN. Okay, so these are very nice applications of algebraic geometry, not this. This is a very simple once which I can show it here. There are plenty of such nice applications. I, uh, if you are interested in, you can go through any book for uh, algebraic geometry. Okay, I am finishing here. If you have any question or doubts, please ask me. Uh, thank you, Suvita D. Thank that you. was a really wonderful lecture. Thank you for your attention.
if any of the participants have a question, kindly put in the chat box or you can admit yourself and speak up. So I have a, uh, I'm curious to know that uh, are all the participants have uh, seen this before or uh, anyone has seen this before? If you can, if you are interested to answer, please answer. So I'm uh, stop now and can I stop my uh, screen sharing? Uh, of course you can. If none of the participants have any question, I think we can end the lecture here.